unfortunately, um, this is the least confident I've been about a sermon in the whole series, so thanks for building it up and then. So, you got this. So, this is why I'm nervous about this message because every once in a while I run across a concept in God's Word that is so powerful. And I feel so insufficient in communicating how important it is for your life. So we're in the Psalm 119 series. This is week 12, Lamed, and I've titled it Forever Satisfying. This is actually, in reality, set up to be the actual dead center of Psalm 119. And it's constructed just a little bit differently than the other ones, and I'll explain that in just a minute. But just to let you guys know, this is the last one on Psalm 119 for about four weeks. Give you a little bit of a break to digest the 12 weeks. Uh, Megan is going to be teaching on worship for the next two weeks, which I'm excited about. That'll be fun. She'll do a good job with that. And then Daryl will be back from, you know, eight months of vacation. He'll be back. <laughs> and he'll be preaching uh, for two weeks. So that's what's coming on in August. I'll be here every week, though. So you make sure, because I have a names list in the back. So. <laughs> so is there ever a song or a movie or an album you were forced to watch, to listen to for all eternity in your coffin? What would it be? I mean, if you had to pick one food you had to eat, <clears throat> by the way, that coffin thing, I know that's dark, but I think about that all the time. When I hear a song, would I want to hear that for the next thousand years in my coffin? I just, it's sick, I know, but I'm just asking you. <laughs> if you had to pick one food the rest of your life that you could, you had to eat, could you name it? What about one book? Oh, the Bible. I know because you all love Jesus. I get it. The Bible. <laughs> I got it. You're special. I got it. Here's the problem that we have living here on this earth. The world gets old. And after a while, can no longer satisfy us. Even things you enjoy the most will make you sick, bored. They lose their shine. Because the world was not made to endure forever. But the miracle of God's word is that those who love it, I mean, if you really love it, never actually grow tired of reading it studying it, or talking about it. It's always fresh. It's always new. It's always powerful. It's always fascinating. And what is the reason? Well, I'm going to teach you that today. <clears throat> I'm going to teach you the miracle of why God's word is forever satisfying. I want you to pay attention to this new concept for some of you. I think it will blow some of you out of the water because I know some of you have never heard it before. Because you're new in your faith and your walk. And some of you will see that this will forever change the way you look at the Bible or God's word. So with that, let me explain to you how this one is constructed. This is the middle section. And this song is divided into two sections. The way this is written, and you can clearly see because Hebrew is a poetic language, the way the psalmist constructs this, there are two things. The first thing is verses 89 and 91 are the hook. The chorus that sticks in your mind that deserves repeating over and over again. There are a lot of hooks in the world that are really catchy. Oh, I like that, that chorus. That hook is really cool. And after a while, every hook gets a little bit old. That's verse 89 through 91. It's the catchy, artistic description of the subject of this song. And it cannot be repeated enough. It's the core, guys, of the whole point of this whole album of songs we call Psalm 119. It is the reason the psalmist was inspired to create the greatest artistic, artistic expression of God's word in the history of man. And that's what Psalm 119 is. The second part of the psalm is verses 92 to 96. This is the verse that would be sandwiched in between the chorus from the beginning and the end. So that's the way the song is constructed. It's constructed so that you would sing 89 to 91, then sing a verse, then sing 89 to 91 again. So think about it that way as we go through today. With that in mind, let's read the chorus first. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You can almost hear the, the rhythm. Forever, O Lord, your word is fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You, you, you have established the earth, and it stands fast. 
By your appointment they stand, for all things are your servants. So you can see how there's a little rhythm for each line, right? That's the chorus. Here's the verse. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. I am yours, save me, for I have sought your precepts. The wicked lie in wait to destroy me, but I consider your testimonies. I have seen a limit to all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. By the way, that word broad is the same one that we learned in week one, week two, week nine, week ten. It's been a theme throughout. So that's the verse. And like in any good song, the verse gives you more information, an understanding about the story the psalm is telling. And then, like any good song, the chorus gives a really good summary of what the verse is trying to tell you, what the artist is trying to tell you. So let's look at the historical part of today's passage. Kind of tra uh, track with me the history. What about man? What was he thinking? What did he do? Why did he do it? Why did he write this? Talking about the eternal word of God. This section will uncover for you an astonishing truth. It explains what the psalmist meant when he said he wanted to see God's word with his eyes. Remember that in last week's passage? I want to see your commandments. I want to experience your salvation. I want to see your commandments. Are you ready? Here it is. First of all, the word of God is limitless. We see that in the word, the heavens. Shamaim. Lofty. The visible arc of the sky in which the clouds move, even where the planets revolve. What he's saying is the word of God <clears throat> is more expansive than the universe. Isn't that a great picture? As a matter of fact, there's a New Testament concept that Paul writes about in this in Colossians 1, 16 to 17. I'm going to read this. Look what he says. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible, see with my eyes, and invisible. Whether thrones or kingdoms or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Now, I just communicated to you two concepts, one of which is the idea that God's word is more expansive than the universe. But this Verse in Colossians leads to another truth that's going to blow, your, blow you away and help you understand why it is so expansive. And that is included in the next word, timeless. All generations in verse 90, he says the word of God is limitless. Then he says it's timeless. All generations. To war. The revolution of time, age, or generation eternal. That's what the Hebrew word means. Now, are you ready? John 1, 1 to 4. Let me read this. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Who's He, the Word? All things were made through Him. You see how Colossians says the same thing? And without Him was not anything made that was made. Remember Genesis? Genesis? In him was life, salvation, and the life was the light of the men. The word of God is considered the light. Remember last week we learned that God's word is salvation. Do you remember that? How the psalmist longed to see salvation with his eyes. What John 1, 1 to 4 explains is that the word of God was from the beginning just as Jesus was. Jesus is the word. Become flesh. John 1.14, I love this one, in case you think I was lying. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Also, through him, the glory of what? God's word. Glory as the, as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Thy word is truth. Do you see the picture I'm painting for you here? Why is the word of God limitless, boundless to all generations? Because the word of God is Jesus. Jesus is the word of God. The scripture teaches us that the word was from the beginning and Jesus became the word of God in the flesh, dwelt among us. 
You know what else we learn about God's word? It is unchanging in verse 91. By your appointment, they stand to this day. The, the phrase stand to this day is the Hebrew word. Hamad. To stand in various relationships to abide, to confirm, continue, endure, establish, remain. You ready? Look at another comparison between God's word and Jesus. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There is an undeniable concept woven. And I, by the way, this is just a few verses. There are about 70, 80, 90 places I could point to in the Old and New Testament where the descriptions of God's word are the same as the descriptions of our Savior, Jesus. Do you see what we're learning here today? Jesus is God's word in the flesh. That's why it, God's word, and he, Jesus, is our salvation. That's when the psalmist says, I long for your salvation. I want to see it with my eyes. He's talking about the promised one. That's why they are both one and the same, both eternally satisfying. That's why the psalmist says constantly that God's word is his salvation. And he longs to see it with his eyes, Jesus. Revelation 1, 17 to 18. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last I am the living one. In him, all life was created. There was no life except through him. Remember, we talked about that just a few minutes ago. I die and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and hell. That's a lot. I just laid out for you some pretty deep level stuff in about nine minutes. I hope you're tracking with me. God's word, Jesus, both eternal the word became flesh. They are both our salvation. Theological. What about God? What did he do and why and how does he do it? I want to talk about the satisfying word of God. So we understand what the word of God is. This is more about what the word of God does. This explains how God's word satisfies us through its truth and through its embodiment in Jesus. First of all, there's an emotional satisfaction in verse 92. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. Here's the Hebrew word, shashua, enjoyment, pleasure, almost to the term hedonism. If your law had not been my hedonistic delight, I would have perished. It means tangibly it satisfies us, able to be, to be perceived by touch, identified by the mind, with value being appraised by experiencing. Oh, have you ever been to Bora Bora? Nobody here, it's great. Well, I have been. It's fantastic. You see the difference? I'm experiencing how awesome it is. because I can, I can tell you how awesome it is. I can assign a value to it because I have actually experienced it. I will never forget your precepts, or by them you have given me life. I am yours, save me. For I have sought your precepts. The wicked lie in wait to destroy me, but I consider or dwell on your testimonies. Bene, to distinguish mentally, understand, feel, know from experience. That's important. Then there's another way it satisfies us, and this is my favorite one. This is the one I love the most because I am a grinder. My mind goes all the time. I wake up at night, I'm thinking. And when I'm watching... Even a Seinfeld episode I've seen a dozen times, I have to rewind it all the time because I'm so ADHD thinking about other stuff. Anybody relate to that? Amen. I mean, last, I, last night, not last night, the night before last, I was watching a show and I got angry with myself. I had to, re I had to rewind the same part nine times because <laughs> I kept writing an email and rewind. Well, just pause it. No, I, I got to do them both. Here's what he says in verse 96. I have seen a limit to all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. Here's the word, 
Rahab, Rumi, in any or every direction. We've studied this word before. God's words, truths, and insights are never exhausted. We can never know all that it says. And we are tempted to rely upon our achievements, our wisdom, our understanding, our experiences, or the achievements, understanding, and wisdom experiences of those that we might admire. We try to live precar uh, vicariously, that's what I was trying to say, <laughs> through other people. We are tempted to look for purpose and direction from men. Their, ex their science, their experiences, their riches. But all of these things have one thing in common. Their imperfection, their finiteness, in other words, their ending. But what a tremendous comfort to know that the word of God from the beginning, in the form of Jesus, that in the midst of man's ideas, man's studies, man's accomplishments and sciences, Constantly changing, by the way. Here's one thing you know about science. The more man learns, the more science changes because man undercovers new physical truths all the time. Why? Because man's mind is finite. We're still learning. Therefore, it proves that our understanding of science lacks perfection, right? Because things are always changing. But you know what does not lack perfection? The word of God. It stands in great contrast to man. All right, here's the devotional part of this passage. The, word of, the, word, the world fails, but God's word won't. I want to give you a concept. The world equals bait and switch. <clears throat> I've defined it for you. The ploy of offering something desirable to gain trust, only to thwart expectations with something less desirable. It's a business concept. Bait and switch. Let me read this to you from my... Journal. After all, my Boston CDs, and, and Lee was actually wearing a Boston shirt today. Isn't that great? See that? <laughs> and I asked him if he would give it to me. He said, well, you'd have to wear it as a headband because he's really skinny. <laughs> but, but I'll do it. That's not story. <laughs> <laughs> After a while, my Boston CDs, which I love, is my favorite band of all time. Tacos, which I love and haven't had for years. Sports which I love, science, which I love, family, which I love, <laughs> friends, cars, even ministry fails to satisfy me. But God's word never ceases to amaze me, challenge me, intimidate me, right? Comfort me, transform me, and satisfy me. It is roomy in any or every direction it is without limitation in its content, its wisdom, power, influence, and durability. It is exceedingly broad. Everything on this earth I hold dear will fail me and be consumed sooner or later. That will not and cannot happen with the word of God. I wrote this almost 25 years ago. So all those things were still kind of new to me at the time. I had a Geostorm was my car. That... That didn't last long. I got rid of that, yeah. <laughs> but I want you to understand. <clears throat> but I want you to understand about the world versus God's word, the, the idea of bait and switch. We are often tempted to set God's word aside, or Jesus for that matter, because they're the same. We got that now, right? When you decide not to spend time with God's word, you're saying, I don't want to spend time with Jesus. It really is the same, biblically. We are often tempted to set God's word or Jesus aside for the sake of our love for the world. We fall for the lie that the world will satisfy us, either its people, its pursuits, or its possessions. That was all three Ps that I made up right on my, right now, I did not write those down. That was very good. <laughs> we expect them to satisfy us, to fill us, or give us purpose Scratch every itch. If we can just get enough of it, it will fill us. But that's the great lie, isn't it? The great lie is that these things never last and ultimately make you go farther than you want to go. 
They'll ultimately make you stay longer than you want to stay, and ultimately they will cost you more than you're ever willing to pay. This is the constant struggle, the war that rages within each child of God. But by faith, the gift of faith, we see God's word in Jesus as the same. And suddenly your passions begin to change. Why? Because, but God's word, meaning in written form and in the form of Jesus, equals salvation. While the world equals bait and switch, God's word equals salvation. Eternal. Let me read this to you. This is a great quote from a, a pastor in uh, Oak, Oklahoma City. Good, solid, reformed pastor. He's really great. God's word is... Ex okay, no, never mind. I wrote this. This is so good, I wrote it. Just ignore the name on the bottom. <laughs> God's word is exquisite, sublime, splendid, and sweet. God's word is powerful, faithful, righteous and true. God's word is great, glorious, grand and good. I came up with three Ps. He's got G's all over the place. It's great. great. Why? Because in it we see God. You hear that? I long to see your salvation. Through it, he draws near. By means of its truth, we experience the incomparable joy of knowing him and seeing him and beholding the beauty of his infinite elegance. Sam Storms, pastor of Bridgeway Church in Oklahoma City. This is God's word. This is the miracle of why God's word is eternally satisfying because it is our Savior Jesus who died on the cross, conquered the grave, resurrected, and is coming again. I mean, here's the problem. We say we want to know Jesus, but we spend very little time with him. Literally with him in his word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And then the word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is why the word of God is eternally satisfying. Not only does it satisfy us day by day, but it saves us for all eternity. If you truly want to know Jesus, here he is. He's in the pages of that Bible or the kilobytes on your Bible app. Lamentations 3, 22, and 20. Yeah, digital Jesus, if you will. Kind of, you know. <laughs> the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Do you believe, Lamentations? That God's mercies, his word, his salvation is new and fresh every day. Look, we're going to take a month off of Psalm 119 now for some other things. But here's the challenge I'm giving you. It's time, if you're a child of God, to stop pretending. If you really love Jesus, I've given you the place to see him. And it's up to you to figure out if you've been given the gift of faith enough to know that I need to be with it. Always. It's time, church. We have 10 weeks left of Psalm 119. We'll start back up in September, and there's some really deep stuff in there. But as children of God, don't pretend that you love Jesus and not spend any time with him. I long to see my salvation. It's in those pages or those kilobytes. Heavenly Dad, your love never ceases. It never comes to an end. <clears throat> they are new every time we open it. The miracle of you becoming the word in the flesh so that we could be eternally satisfied is astonishing. It's a deep theological concept that our minds without the gift of faith could never understand. But it's right there in your word. In you, all things are created. Through you, there is life and there would not be life without you. 
You are where we see our salvation. And while we do, Jesus, long for that day where we can see you face to face, we can see you every day of our lives if our hearts desire it. Help us not to continue to fall for the bait and switch trick. Because after a while, even the sins that we love so much deceive us and let us down. But dad, we admit this is the constant struggle that rages within us. We want so bad to spend time with you, but there's another part of us that wants so bad to spend time with the world. It's like going into the campfire, putting our hand in too close, getting burned and running back to where it's comfortable. Why do we do it over and over again? If your word had not been my delight, I would have perished. God, we continue to sit before you.